I'm Nicholas Tolson with Linear Tube Audio, and I'm here with a good friend of mine, an old friend of mine, Jared Sims, who is Associate Professor and Director of Jazz Studies at West Virginia University. How are you doing, Jared? I'm doing great. How about you, Nicholas? Fantastic. It's great to see you. Uh, like I said, Jared and I grew up together and, you know, we really did. We rode the bus together. Uh, you know, we, we, I, I played the saxophone in, in, uh, in middle school. I don't think I ever got to high school. Uh, and, you know, but only one of us has multiple albums to our names and has shared the stage with uh, many people we've all heard of and is a tenured professor at a uh, major university. So it's great to have have you and um, so let's start there so uh, associate professor and director of jazz studies at West Virginia University uh, what does that mean what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis Wow uh, you know it's a it's a real grab bag of things you know music itself tends to be kind of a portfolio career and at this level it still remains that way uh, it's kind of an entrepreneurial position where um, you know there's there's some artistic vision involved but a lot of it uh, frankly i do a lot of recruiting of students um, i met with a couple of high school students this week I'm trying to really give to the community be kind of present um, try to encourage students to to feel like they can be musicians which is a really big thing but there's also the curriculum um, you know making sure all the courses are are there and uh, advising students in terms of teaching my my load is mostly ensembles, especially in the fall. Uh, I think one of my can one of my classes I canceled so I could spend more time with ensembles. So I really want I want students playing. We got a whole variety of majors from everything from like uh, uh, health science, like a, like basically a pre med music degree, all the way through to musicians who are music performers. I just want to get them all really busy. We got talented students that are going to be doctors. We got talented students that are going to be engineers. We got talented students that are going to be teachers, uh, people in the industry. Music therapy is hot, and uh, and then there's just some students that just really want to play, and they then they can do it. So so that's kind of that's kind of my role is just kind of putting all these students together and you know making it all happen. Yeah, that's cool. It sounds like a, a it's a pretty big job. That's why you have two titles. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, how is it? So we've got this crisis going on, and we've all got you know we've all been affected by many in many different ways. And but education, and certainly you know uh, higher education where people are traveling to to come to school, uh, usually. Uh, has been affected. How is th this affecting your students the upcoming class year or do you even know yet? Is it too early? It's a little early. I mean we, we do have a lot of international students like every every small school or large school every school in the United States has international students so that that's a really big concern um, and I'm not sure that the general public knows how much money and how much revenue comes from inter international students and, and just, you know, what this country is known for is our culture and our education. So um, I think I think that's one one big thing. I, I'm, I'm thinking specifically there's a there's there's some students from Asia who are trapped at home and they don't know if they'll be able to make it back. Um, uh, aside from that, you know, I, I think we've realized how bad we are at teaching technology or uh, even the, the faculty knowing technology or awareness of what's possible. Um, I see limitations in the technology and, and that's not really the, the conversation. I think most people are, are at the point where, oh my gosh, what, what do we need to know how to do? And so, um, you know, school's out. I shouldn't be working, but a couple of days ago, I pulled a bunch of students together to tell them, like these are the recommendations, this is the gear that you need, this is the microphone, this is the cable that you use. Like, you know, it's possible to get three degrees in music and not know what an XLR cable is. And, and so really? you know, a lot of the world, a lot of the world doesn't know that. But yeah, we, we get so locked up in, in tradition and our music schools carry a curriculum that dates back to a hundred years ago. And so there's there's no room for technology, and technology is also evolving. And so, you know, given those two, the, those two aspects of the situation, we're, we're not really teaching it. 
That's crazy. Well, it's something that I wanted to get to, but, uh, you know, and so I'll skip to it because it seems relevant, but, you know, many people, I think lots of people out there, the, the only insight they've seen into a jazz program is the movie Whiplash. And that, that doesn't necessarily, I know from talking to certain people that that doesn't necessarily uh, reflect the truth and is not a good representation necessarily uh, of, the, of the academic, the music academic world. But, you know, it sort of surprises me that you, especially this day and age, is that, that there isn't a, a focus on the technology and some of the more practical sides of being a musician. And so you know, briefly, what is a jazz program like in, you know, the modern day? Well, uh, you know, the, the, the sound bit that I give to people is jazz education is kind of a moving target. The further we get away from Louis Armstrong, the, the less students know what Louis Armstrong sounds like, the less they have a, a real deep sense of swing and feel. Um, and, and really, the more the technology has taken over, you know, really technology to me really started happening in jazz music when Miles Davis did Bitches Brew. And I, I went to a clinic with Tio Macero, who was the producer of that. He talked about literally splitting the, the tape with scissors. And you can hear it if you go into the recording. So Miles Davis used a recording studio as a means of... of of writing music and, and production and, and composition were kind of put together from Miles Davis. And we're talking, what, 40, 50 years ago. But, but so much of what we're doing in traditional jazz school is we're still kind of celebrating the 50s and mid 60s, like that era of, uh, you know, all the stuff that you would hear on mainstream jazz radio, which is really, um, it's really important. It's, it's something you can quantify and you can teach. You can, you can tell when somebody's playing wrong notes. And so you give, you give students some chords and if they play the wrong notes, it's like you can circle on the page or point it out. So it's, it's easy to quantify, but um, you know, I, I think I, think I kind of want to have it both ways, to be honest. I, I want the students to swing because it's jazz, but I think they also need to figure out like what this means for their own artistry and whatever their destination is and so I, I frankly I want it both ways I want I want our students to to be able to sit down with uh with a sunny stit record and transcribe it but but also know what aspect of that can sound like Maceo Parker you know um to and and you know sunny stit of course is a very very uh, traditional instrumentalist from the 50s and 60s and Maceo's in his late seventies, and he's still touring. And he was he was he was great with James Brown's band, and he played with Prince. And uh, you know he's he's a hero too. And so um, I'm I'm giving you a long answer, but it's a complicated thing. You know, a lot of jazz programs will go one direction or another, and I see what I'm trying to do here is also having some kind of a commercial element because the students the students have to be relevant. They have to be able to make money. And they, they have to use jazz as a tool to build in, in other directions, as far as I can really uh, best describe it. And especially these days in the world of you know, self-publishing, not even getting into the fact that now we're stuck at home and there's tons of people you know, doing you know, home uh, broadcasts and, and recording. But yeah, there is just a practical uh, part uh, to the commercial uh, aspect of it. And it helps to, even if you, you know, get to the point where you're not doing your own recording, you are working in a studio with a producer, any knowledge that you have about that helps you interact with the equipment and the engineers and the producers and other musicians involved because you're you're just familiar with what you're going into i went to art school in a different medium photography and a much you know a, a big art school that had many different um, mediums you know sculpture and fine art and everything else and i have to say there too it was it was somewhat you know, it's getting better but somewhat of a limitation uh for the the business and commercial aspects of of being an artist and as much as we don't want to admit it, you know, you got to make money and there's a commercial aspect to it. It's of course about the love of it and the art and expressing yourself. But you know, if you can't pay your rent, then you can't really express yourself. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm, I'm curious how many, how many classes did you have that taught you how to make a website or how to run a business or 
you know, how does a solicit work? I mean, was, was that part of your curriculum at all? Uh, well, no. I mean, well, I, I went to school in the mid, like you, I went to school in the mid early 90s. Uh, so, you know, like websites certainly weren't a, a part of the curriculum back then. Right. But um, yeah, it was, I mean, and, and I guess the same thing with the, probably your school, it depends on the school. So my school was very self-expression focused. It was, you know, a fancy New York City art school. And so they were all about the art and expressing yourself. And, you know, they were very few classes on offer. And to be honest with you, as a, you know, uh, late teen, early 20s, I'm not sure I would have gravitated towards the more, uh, you know, practical, boring business uh, classes anyway. But, um, you know, and I haven't checked it out lately, but I think they are, they're seeing that, that that's a weakness. And then there's also the other side that's, you know, career services and career placement. And, you know, so I'm like at West Virginia, I'm sure there's, you know, West Virginia, the jazz program there might have a, a particular focus and another school might have you know, more or less focus on the practical business aspect. But I guess that's one of the advantages of you having this dual role where you, you are tasked with and you can sort of shape that curriculum um, you know, to you know, bring in some of these uh, you know, things that you feel are necessary to be a musician today. Yeah, I think you know, it, it's, it's really complicated when you think about getting rid of classes or adding classes. And you certainly can't add more because these guys are already really, really busy with that. But, you know, sometimes just an awareness of it, making the students aware of it. And then, you know, I, I, I get, I have some choices about what artists that we bring in too. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's a really big aspect of it, you know, to, uh, it's it's a it's a matter of aesthetic you know what what we what we kind of present in terms of concerts or guest artists but yeah it, it, it's it's a complicated thing and you know all the students have different goals too and so we 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 can't we can't be everything to everybody but i i do think it's really really important uh, i mean you said expression and and uh, uh, that's one of two words that i use for for students that are doing this music it's like we're kind of finding this balance between expression and knowing the tradition. And it's really that, you know, sometimes people are 80% tradition and 20% expression. And that, that, would be, that would be my recipe for getting radio play. If I wanted to get radio play on a real standard station now, you know, have it really be about the tradition. But then it's, as soon as it starts to be more expression, then it starts to be maybe more of a kind of a niche. And, uh, so either either you have a an audience that's really uh, empathetic, you know, like John Medeski, that guy could do anything he wants, and he's a great pianist. So, you know, Medeski and Martin Woods kind of kind of in the style, you know, sort of, but you know, he he's got some really great projects in which you know he's very expressive, and and you know his his fans you know, gravitate toward that, and so. And that's that's just one example. There's there's a bunch for sure. Well, uh, yeah, I love uh, John Medeski, Medeski, Martin, and Wood. Uh, my I was involved in the pressing of one of his albums for his new band, and uh, my wife and I actually met at a Medeski Martin and Wood show back in 1999. So he's an artist that's that's close to my heart, and yeah, he's achieved um, you know a, a, a relative uh, level of fame, quote unquote, in the non-traditional jazz world. 